a link now on the web page to a YouTube playlist. The YouTube playlist has the videos that we've been making of lectures this semester. So if you go to YouTube, if you click on that link, it should take you to playlist and if you look at it, it has one video because that's how many videos we've made so far. Uh, I'm going to record today's and I'll be on part of it, Dr. Jeff will be on part of it, and I'll get that uploaded later on today, hopefully. Um, this is now up and running and I, co I corrected dates from the last time uh, that were wrong from last time. so. Um, this is kind of where we finished. And do you have any questions over anything that we did last time before we get started? Nada? Okay. Uh, then the next thing that we're going to talk about is, so these two guys did all this work, published these two papers, Darwin went on to write a book. Basically, what did they say? What are the, the things that I refer to as the four preconditions for the theory of evolution via natural selection. What has to happen for natural selection to occur? Uh, somebody other than you, two guys, two guys talk every day. Yeah, great. Um, What is the phenotype? Yeah, the outward expression of genes. What you see, the physiological capacity that organisms have. So it exists. What else? Nobody's just not going to say anything. Just look ahead. Yeah, go ahead. The like traits are heritable. Are you looking at your slides also? Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> so this variation is heritable. And so we'll talk about what heritability mm -hmm. means in a little while, although, did you talk a little bit about this last time? Yeah, you guys should be able to get at least one. Yeah. <laughs> um, next Monday, you're not going to have a PowerPoint slide in front of you for this. <laughs> uh, what's the last one? Go ahead. The varying, the varying phenotype affects the fitness, the reproductive fitness of the organism. A simple four, four point sort of set of ideas. Um, the one that is least obvious about all of this is the first one where it talks about the overproduction of offspring, or as, as, um, as Darwin put it, he basically said, um, organisms tend to produce way more offspring than can possibly survive. This has to do with population growth, and <coughs> comes from a set of ideas put forth by a guy named Malthus, who was a philosopher and a demographer, talking about how unchecked population growth in Europe in the late 1800s was ultimately going to lead to populations outstripping their food supply and it was going to lead to death and famine and disease and pestilence and crime and war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's the guy who gave, gave economics the, the nickname, essentially, as a result of this. Uh, economics for many decades was referred to as the dismal science because it predicted all of these terrible, terrible outcomes. But the rest of these are all just kind of less ecological and more evolutionary. But basically, if not everybody can, su can survive and reproduce, then what separates who can and can't survive and reproduce? Well, the variation among individuals is part of that. 
that variation being heritable makes it something that can be passed down from generation to generation, and that variation leads to differences in fitness. When we say the word fitness, what do we mean? <coughs> So ability to survive is part of it, but I survived to the ripe old age of 50, whoops, 50, oh yeah, 53, had to count here for a minute. The ripe old age of 53, but what have I not done that puts my fitness at zero? I have failed to reproduce after all these years. So simply surviving doesn't get you there, it gets you partway there. You can't reproduce if you die before your reproductive age, but simply living to reproductive age doesn't do anything for your fitness if you then fail to go on and reproduce. So don't forget both aspects of that. Nothing wrong with the survival answer, it's just incomplete. So, when we talk about fitness in this class, I'm generally going to refer to fitness as lifetime reproductive success. Uh, Dr. Joe, what's your fitness? Zero. If you're willing to share. Zero. Oh, John is at zero. Uh, Walensky is at zero. Um, Dr. Reynolds, do you guys know Dr. Reynolds? She's the department chair in the department. Does anybody know what her fitness is? Reynolds has a fitness of two. She's kicking her butt. Uh, Dr. Wara, who teaches developmental biology, anybody know what his fitness is? Luke is guessing. <laughs> What's the Duggar's fitness? Twenty-one. <laughs> is it twenty-one now? Yeah. Is it twenty-one now? Mm -hmm. When do they find time to pop out two more? <laughs> Last I saw, it was nineteen and counting, whatever that means. Here's the thing about fitness: there's absolute fitness, which is just the number of offspring that you have. Dr. Gentire is zero. <laughs> Dr. Reynolds is at two, Laura is at three, Ron Lee is at one. So if you ignore the Duggars, then everybody else is doing relatively better than us, and they're also doing better in an absolute sense. But there's this other thing called relative fitness, which is what's your fitness relative to the most fit individual in the population? And when we talk about fitness, we're talking about evolutionary fitness, not fitness as human beings or fitness as parents, which you might call that mind, perhaps. I don't know. I don't know the people. But relative fitness would be what your fitness is divided by the fitness of the most fit individual in the population. So usually when we talk about fitness, we're going to be talking about relative fitness. How many offspring have you produced in your entire life relative to the most productive individual in your population? <laughs> Which here in America is... So, um, that's what fitness is all about. So, when we talk about more offspring being produced than can survive, we a lot of times think of exponential growth, and we're going to talk about exponential growth more after the first exam. Uh, so that's actually the first thing that we take up after that, is we'll teach you how growth equations work and how you can derive these. But basically, exponential growth is just growth that goes on unchecked. And if you let this happen, what will happen is exactly what Malta said, which is you'll have more individuals than the environment can support, and eventually something has to give. And when we express this in population growth terms, we usually talk about this in terms of density-dependent population growth, where the effect of the density of the population has an effect on how fast the population can grow. And in theory, the population grows up to that upper limit of what the environment can support, and then it stops changing after that. And it doesn't mean that you just have that same, those same individuals. You have individuals dying, and you have new individuals entering the population. But in this case, birth and death rates are going to be equal, so that for every individual that is born, an individual dies, which is why this levels off. And so it's that living at carrying capacity where you have equal, equal rates of birth and death. That's what gives you That's what gives you this situation where not everybody can survive. Not everybody's going to survive and reproduce.
produce because the environment ultimately constrains how many individuals can live in that environment. That's the first, the first thing in all of this. If everybody lives and survives and reproduces, why can you not have natural selection? There's no differences among individuals. In order for, for this to work, individuals have to have variation, not only in, in phenotype and all that, but variation in fitness. So this is a, a, the earliest precondition, which is why I always list it first. So variation exists in populations. We've talked about this already a couple of times this semester. When we were talking about coots, when we were talking about horn lizards. Um, this is an old graphic from, I believe this is Yale University, uh, way back in time, basically showing how height is an approximately normally distributed curve. There are differences in height among females, which are here in white, and males, which are in black. But there's this idea that, that variation exists out in nature. Whether you're talking about human height, we could all take you down to the track, run you around the track. Some of you would be fast, some of you would be slow. We'd take you out onto a road, make you run 10 miles, some of you would make it, some of you wouldn't. Uh, some of you would run that 10 miles faster than other people would run that 10 miles, et cetera, et cetera. There's variation in phenotype. Some of that variation is underlain by genetics. I think Dr. Zeta already talked to you about this also. Some of that variation is underlain by environment. If you want to become a faster runner, what do you do? You go out and run a lot, train every day to be a faster runner. If you want more endurance, you go out and train to run longer and longer distances. Uh, this past weekend, I just rode a century. It was my, a century is just a 100 mile bike ride that you can all in one, in one sitting. Um, back in July, I rode 117 miles in the mountains of Colorado. How do you get to the point that you can just go out and ride 100 miles on a Saturday? Well, you start off at 20, and then you lengthen that to 30, and then you lengthen that to 40, and then you lengthen that to 68, and then you lengthen that to 75, and then you lengthen that to 100. You don't get up tomorrow having never bicycled and say, hey, I'm going to ride a century <laughs> tomorrow. So environment has a role in this variation, but also um, there's a certain amount of, of innate genetic predetermination that sets limits on what you can, you can ultimately achieve in terms of phenotypic performance. So then the question is, to what degree is this variation genetically determined? We can measure this by basically measuring what is called heritability. Heritability is, in its simplest way, determined by the resemblance among relatives. And the easiest way to do this is to look at your parents' average phenotypic value. Let's say this is the average value of height. Look at the offspring phenotypic value averaged across all of the offspring. The correlation between those two things determines how heritable the trait is. So if this were human height, we could get all of the heights of, of your parents and all of your siblings that have grown up all fully. Your infant brother doesn't count because he hasn't achieved his full height yet. But if all of your siblings were, were fully grown, we could look at what your average height of your parents is and what your average height of you and your siblings are, run that regression, and this tells us how heritable that trait is going to be. To what degree does the height of your parents determine what the height of their offspring is? And so that's the simplest way. You can do this with all sorts of complex breeding designs to look at how um, similarities among siblings, full siblings and half siblings, uh, can tell you what heritability is. As long as you have resemblance among relatives, you can figure this out. This is just the simplest way. In this situation, the heritability is practically not there at all, a heritability of 0.1, because the parental value doesn't have any effect on the offspring value. So heritability can go from a theoretical minimum of zero to a theoretical maximum of one, and the closer you are to one, the more heritable the trait is. We'll give you some equations later in the semester where you can use this to actually calculate what's going to happen to traits over time, but we're not going to do that today. So like with the dominant genotype have a bigger 
Okay, so you're confusing terms. So dominant and recessive refer to the action of alleles. What are alleles or alleles or however you want to pronounce it? What is an allele when we talk about alleles? So part of being a gene is that you're capable of being inherited. Luke has had genetics, so he should know what a gene is. You gave like the crisp golden definition at the beginning of the class. Almost. I did, and I repeated it over and over again throughout the semester. Yeah. I heard about like a jerk that passed from one parent to the offspring. So she got the inheritance part. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So a gene is is a unit of inheritance, but there's a better definition. So when it gets inherited from generation to generation, what's actually being transmitted? Mm -hmm. Epigenotype. Or mm -hmm. epigenotype. Well, okay, but go down even lower in the scale. To a chromosome, the lower oh, a chromosome. Okay. Well, like proteins. Not proteins, proteins are the result of taking DNA, transcribing it into RNA, and then translating it into the phenotype, into a protein, into an amino acid sequence. Go back to Okay, a nucleotide. So, so a gene is basically a unit of inheritance, but we get our inheritance through what molecule? What, what major biological molecule? DNA. So it's a sequence of DNA. So I'm, I'm going really reductionist on you. So we, in, technically, a gene is a sequence of new of, of nitrogenous bases in a molecule of DNA. Now, Luke, what do those nitrogenous base sequences tell us? How a gene is inherited? Not how a gene is inherited. <coughs> how it's passed down? No, that's just another word for inheritance. <laughs> the nitrogenous bases tell us what proteins to make. Sequence of nitrogen spaces in DNA that code for a specific sequence of amino acids in, pro in a protein. Are proteins the only thing that DNA specifies for? What else does DNA sequences specify for? This is the central dogma, basically, of going from DNA to messenger RNA to protein. familiar with this transcription translation so what else does DNA code for the answer is on the board started on this and we could get to a definition of what an allele is. <laughs> it's on the board. What does DNA first code for in the central dogma? The RNA. Sequence of DNA nucleotides, those nitrogenous bases in DNA, get encoded into a molecule of RNA, but it's the RNA that actually tells the ribosome what order to put amino acids into as you're making a protein. So it doesn't just code for a specific sequence of amino acids. 
It also codes for a specific sequence of nitrogenous bases in RNA. Messenger RNA, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, all of those things are determined by genes. Those genes aren't making proteins, they're actually making RNA molecules, and those RNA molecules are functional. They need to be specified in the correct way in order for a ribosome to do its job, in order for a transfer RNA to latch on to the right amino acid and to have the correct anticodon to meet up with messenger RNA. That has to be specified correctly. So now, Luke, do you remember what my definition is, given that we're talking about these other functional products of DNA other than just proteins? The sequence of nitrogenous bases code for a set of RNA. Okay, well, we call RNA all the RNAs in the protein and sometimes transcription factors and all these other things. Big, a big grouping, broad group of things. I lumped in under this. You're gonna kick yourself on your right arm. Functional product. Just a functional product, whatever it happens to be. This is the nice thing about this is it covers everything. It covers RNAs. It covers proteins. It covers anything that uses the information content in DNA to specify the order of something else for your downstream. This is a much broader way of thinking about a gene than the way I learned about genes in public school and probably the way you learned about public, uh, genes in public school, which is that DNA specifies the, the sequence of amino acids in a protein. Proteins are important, but Not all genes get transcribed and translated into final products. There's a lot of regulation of gene expression that is done by regulating after a messenger RNA molecule is formed, does that messenger RNA molecule get translated into a protein? Oftentimes, you transcribe a messenger RNA molecule and then it just sits around until it eventually degrades without ever getting translated into a protein. Sometimes a gene doesn't ever get turned on in a particular cell because it's not useful in that cell and so there's a gene for it but it never gets transcribed which means it never gets translated and so it never in that particular cell codes for a particular functional product. So gene regulation is super important. So now that we know what a gene is, what is an allyl? How many people want to roll their tongues? Let's see. I don't trust anyone. All right, those of you not rolling your tongue, I'm presumably thinking you're not rolling your tongue because you can't, right? Okay. Wait, roll your tongues again. You're not. You're the only one who can't, okay. <laughs> My Ecology of Food class has 11 people in it. Nobody, can, nobody is missing the ability. This is the first time that I've had everybody in class except one do it. It's an exceptional year and then I have a bunch of tongue rollers. So, tongue rolling is a gene. It, it's determined, it's, it, it's a trait, sorry. Tongue rolling is a phenotype, but that phenotype is determined by a gene. That gene exists in two forms. One form gives you the ability to do this. The other form of that gene prevents you from having that ability. We represent variation in tongue rolling phenotype because all of the rest of us, and Dr. Judd included, have a version of the gene that allows you to roll your tongue and you're lacking that particular version of the gene. So what is an allyl? What are allyls? Yeah. A specific trait given. Okay, the trait here is tongue rolling. So that's the trait. What is an allyl? What are the two allyls of that trait? Uh, yeah, if you want to do them as R, sure, we can do R. One allyl is big R, one allyl is little R, because this gives you the ability to roll. This prevents you from rolling. So these two allyls are just different forms of the same gene, <coughs> different alternative forms. Why did we make this one the big R and this one a little R? 
This one is dominant. And this one is recessive. So back when I asked what an allele is, somebody said something about dominant and recessive, which is why I wanted to go through and unpack this because, or no, it was when we were talking about something being heritable. I asked, oh, why is a trait heritable or not? Well, I don't remember why we got into it, but somebody said something about dominant or recessive, which made me need to unpack all of this to make sure that we're talking about the right things. When you have a dominant allele, you can do whatever it is that that dominant allele allows you to do. And so you can either be a homozygous dominant and be a telomolar, or you can be a heterozygote and a telomolar. But we know what your genotype is because you possess the recessive trait, the recessive phenotype, and because we know that it's the recessive phenotype, you have to be homozygous recessive in order to be expressing that phenotype. And so we know that you are homozygous recessive because if you possess a dominant allele at all, you would be just like the rest of us and just dull telomeres. Now you're special because you don't possess that dominant allele. So is tone rolling a heritable trait? Yes. Okay. How do we determine heritability? You? Punnett squares are useful for some things, they are not useful for this. Can you have separate variation? Okay, on the, on the x-axis, what would we plot? This is the mid parent value, right? So, what's the value of tone rolling? The numerical value of tone rolling? I can do this. What number would you put on it? One. 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 Okay, sure. One. So, you're a mom and dad. points we have on this are 0, 0.5, and 1. This is a belaboring of a point. It's much easier made on the next slide, but I feel necessary to <laughs> If we breed two tongue rollers together, what do we get? Gametes from this guy could be this or this. Gametes from this gal could be this or this, which means one quarter of the population will be this, two quarters of the population will be this, and one quarter of the population will be this. We're going to do genetics in more detail later. I'm just making a point here. What's the phenotypic value, as you guys have determined it over here, of this individual? One. One. What is the phenotypic value of these two individuals? One. What is the phenotypic value of these of this individual? Zero. Zero. So, in this case, we have two tongue rollers, one and one with an average of one, producing one plus one plus one plus zero, that's three divided by four, producing an average offspring phenotype, one, two, three, all at one, and one individual at zero, producing an average offspring phenotype of of 0.75. Not very heritable because this phenotypic value doesn't match that phenotypic value. Not only that, what does it mean to have the phenotypic value of one tongue roll? 
Nothing. It's just this arbitrary number that you threw out there. Why? Because I asked you to give it an arbitrary number, right? <laughs> it's not a quantitative trait. It's a qualitative trait. You either can tongue roll or you cannot tongue roll. And we can attach it a value of 0 to 1. We can also attach a value of 10,000 and 0 to those two outcomes. They're not typical kinds of traits that we think of in terms of being heritable. Because the variation is very discrete. You either can do it or you can't do it. It's like having peas from, from Mendel's experiments where you have either a yellow pea or a green pea. We wouldn't think of those traits as heritable in this way because they occur in these categories. And so what is, what is the numerical value we would place on green versus yellow? Think of a numerical value for green and yellow. So these kind of traits don't work that way. A better trait would be a trait that you can count or a trait that you can measure in some way. So heritable traits have a genetic basis, but heritable traits vary in quantitative sorts of ways, and other traits don't vary in quantitative ways. However, some traits don't have any variability at all. How many fingers do you guys have? Five on each, five on each hand. So number of fingers per hand, five per hand. How many fingers do your parents have? Five per hand, <laughs> ten total. Still, very good. So if we plot heritability of fingers, we don't get an answer because everybody has five fingers, and everybody has five fingers. Not altogether true, because there are people in some places in the United States that have more than five fingers, a condition called polydactyly. So there is some genetic variation for finger number. But as it turns out, it's the same kind of variation as tongue rolling. You either have the extra digits or you don't have the extra digits. The natural condition is five extra digits. So heritability of finger number is not something that you can really talk about. The main reason being that there's no variation for finger number. Tongue rolling isn't heritable because while there is variation in tongue rolling, it's this discrete either or kind of variation, and that isn't usually subject to these kinds of, of evolutionary models of thinking about things. We need to think about variation and its heritability in terms of continuously varying variables like the beak size of Darwin's finches, where we have a range of sizes of Darwin's finches' beaks and the range of Finch beaks in the offspring. This is the parents, this is the offspring. And then the regression between those things gives you a measure of heritability. How likely is it that a large beak finch will give rise to a large beak finch? If you can quantify that, and that can change over time, this is heritability in 1976, this is heritability in 1978. We're going to see these again after the exam. If there is heritability, then that trait can be passed on from generation to generation in a quantitative way. And the last thing is that this phenotypic variation correlates with fitness in some way. And in the horn lizard case, we had how horn length varied quantitatively from individual to individual. And that horn length had real consequences for who got killed by a shrike and who didn't get killed by a shrike. And so if you had horns that were long enough, you got to the point where your horn length was long enough that basically everybody above a certain horn length survived. And as your horn length was lower, shorter and shorter, your chances of surviving went down. The thing that they didn't measure in that was heritability of horn length, although you can make some arguments that horn length would be heritable in the way that height and strip speed and other things is heritable. But they didn't measure that. And so they measured, they measured the final precondition from Darwin without measuring any of the earlier ones, except for the ones that obviously everybody can't survive because some of them were in male market forms. So they showed that there was variation for the trait. They couldn't show that it was heritable, but they did show that it had consequences for fitness. Everything we've been talking about up to this point in this class has been leading you so far towards this set of preconditions. The coot study, the horn lizard study, we're about to jump off into after the first test.
um, ex exploration, detailed exploration of these things. Actually, we're going to start on Wednesday exploring this with population data. Questions about all of that? All right, I'm turning it over to Dr. Judd, and he's going to lead you through talking about your board assignment. All right, you should all have your any questions? Let me say one thing. Um, some of you have asked about how the heck do we do this literature summary thing. So what I did over the weekend, actually I did it this morning, I just lied to you. I did it this morning when I came into to school. Uh, I wrote a literature summary for the Lion et al. paper, the Coop paper, and I also put the Coop paper on there. So there is a, in the, in the top thing on, on Moodle, up there where the syllabus and everything is, right underneath the literature, literature summary, some literature summary instructions, there's also a literature summary example where I have basically written what I think would be a decent literature summary of the Coop paper. And then I also added in there the Coop paper itself, which was published in Nature in 1994. So you can go and read the Coop paper in its entirety, and then you can look at my summary of it, and you'll see in that summary how I glossed over certain details because I was constrained by the two-page requirement. You can also see the kind of, of critical thought that I engaged in in the last half of the paper. And I did this for a paper that you're not going to write a literature summary on so you can see how it's done. So that as you approach papers that I haven't done that before, you can kind of have a reference. Sorry, go ahead. That's good. So you'll have that example. That's where we're going. We're going towards that full two-page summary. Um, but for this assignment and for the forthcoming assignment, just want you to summarize the parts of the paper. We want to get you comfortable with the structure of the introduction, materials and methods, results, and discussion and conclusions. So if you I had some questions about this, and I gather most of you as well, if your summary, your homework that you brought in today, includes a summary of the conclusions or results, just go ahead and cross that out. We're not going to use that for our part of the activity today. Hopefully you have a one-page summary of the introduction. Um, so this introduction is useful to us in, in some ways because it's a little bit longer than a typical introduction. We're going to talk about uh, why we chose this paper and why we chose this, this introduction. What I want you to do um, is find a partner and trade your summary. Go through and read the summary. And as you do, maybe make some notes and reflect on how this summary that you're reading helps you better understand the introduction that you read and you wrote your own summary on. So read the other summary, make some notes on what was useful in reading your colleague's uh, intro, and then we'll come together in your groups and talk about what all of you have learned and come to a general understanding of this introduction, what it does, what its structure is, what it does well, and what it doesn't do so well. So go ahead and trade and read. Any questions? The paper is like hard to like so you're not
basically after reading who was popular. I think it was just because we missed the name. We are going to spend most of our time sitting at the night table. So I should not wear my boot tomorrow then, or should I? Oh, this is really good. Mine was good too. interesting as well. Sometimes we have to sit and 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 sit <laughs> this is what I didn't understand. As you guys are talking in your groups, just a little, a little more clarification. Hopefully, you're talking about what helped you, what reading your partner's uh, summary helped you understand. As you come into the groups, use those reflections and collectively, as, a, as you're in your small group, try to summarize the main points of the introduction. Right? Um, and as you do that, you can ask yourselves two questions. What things in the introduction helped you understand the paper, or what things that, that your partner found helped you understand the paper? And then what aspects of this introduction were challenging? What, what are you still struggling to understand? And why? So, okay, yeah. continue in your groups. And then um, one, so uh, I thought there was very highly scientific language uh, that was sometimes you got more able to understand. Yeah. Yeah, no, it like, you have to like detone yeah, no, the thing. I literally had to Google it. I had to Google it. Oh my gosh. You go way harder. I think you did a great job. I know, but I was like doing that. I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah. Yeah, I wrote it up. I know. I struggled with this. How am I supposed to write a page of review over two pages of I'm like, how am I supposed to write a summary over an introduction? Like, that was what I struggled with. A one page summary over like a page and a half. Mine is really long. And the entire, mine's like three fourths of a page. I had the first one I wrote was that long, and then I was like, well, it's a page, so I had to add more, and then it was too long, and I've edited this like six times, and I still think it should be two lines, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't think they're going to complain that yours is a couple of times. Yeah, but they're going to complain that mine is a couple of times. I'm going to put it six times. I've never heard a teacher complain about my paper being too long, so like, yeah, 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 no. 1 a.m. I've had a spider yeah. bite yeah. all week, and I felt good, and then I woke up and I was still drunk, so I had to go back to bed. I was like, I can't. I didn't have that top one. She has weights at 1 in the morning. I saw that. I threw up so much. Oh, my gosh. I bet you All it is is someone handed me a bottle of hand. I died. <laughs> Oh no, because I walked that home from the track. Yeah. In the rain. I don't know. Information I don't know. Information around the engine. The door was like, what am I so bad? Because the guy who had the mace, I remember he, when he opened the bottle, 
he like had fresh yogurt and said, oh, let me have a drink. He said, okay. But I was like, no, at that point, it didn't even taste like anything. Yeah. <laughs> distant, distant water. Distant, yes. distant. I was like, yeah. just yeah. taking some deep that's, drag. That's like, why they came. And I was like, and they yeah. kicked us out. And I was like, I'll have a ride. Go walk. <laughs> <laughs> that's bad. I don't know so how you got that. I didn't have my scooter. I was just going on it. Awesome. And then, yeah. I'm on the floor and they were trying to put me up in my bed. I'm like, who the you fuck are you so guys? You were so pissed. You gotta get out. You gotta get out. You gotta leave. And then I wake up and I'm in my bed. I know. Because I know I, we came back down to get Bradley in his Sam, room. Like, no, I know. Sam was like, I need to sleep. Sam was like, sleep, but Sam was yelling at us. He's like, bro, get out so that Sam. And we're like, we're trying to get Bradley in his bed. And then Bradley was like, we were so like, so like, Sam was like, you gotta get out. Because Sam was asleep. Get out of the bed. It seems like most of you are starting to have faded out of the discussion. So I think what we do with, uh, with each of your groups is that is Summarize the main points, maybe four or six main points of the investments that you come up with. Um, important, important ideas that you've extracted in order if you were to summarize the paper. Um, maybe some of you hit some and others didn't, so you can come to a consensus on that. What we want to do is make sure you understand what's being done with this paper and what's coming next. But also we're going to try to extract a basic structure of the introduction. And this, in my opinion, the structure of this introduction isn't all that great. It's, it's an unusually long introduction. But it gave you more background on the finches, and that's why it's useful for the remainder of the course. So we're going to try to extract a, um, a structure, a certain set of questions that need to be answered for a good introduction out of this. So we've got some markers up here. I'll put a few more within your groups. Come up with a uh, set of ideas that summarize the introduction and put them up here on the board.